now we welcome in Nima Omidvar to the Young Turfs podcast tonight. Nima, how are you doing? I'm doing great, guys. How y'all doing? We're doing great here on the podcast. Nima, let's start it off from where it all began. A Damascus boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a swarming hornet. We, um, you know, I was not a great player uh, in my day. I'm, I'm very uh, comfortable in my own skin to, to admit that. Coach Pat Cook, who's our high school coach, um, saw something in me that, that I didn't see and gave me an opportunity to, to coach um, my peers, coach, coach the guys that were in my graduating class and the ones behind me. I got a chance to coach summer league in Montgomery County, uh, right out of high school. Uh, did well, did, you know, had fun with it. I, I was passionate. I think one thing has been consistent with me in my career is I'm always going to be passionate about whatever I'm doing, uh, cause it's important to me. And, um, just so happened that an athletic director by the name of Vic Lippman, uh, caught wind of my uh, success. Don't think he knew how old I was. I didn't rush to tell him that I was 18, but I was, you know, hired at Jewish Day at the age of 18, and and that's where this magical journey started. Um, won the PVAC championship in year one. Lost at the buzzer to Cedric Lindsay, who ended up going to Richmond and Gonzaga. He went to Gonzaga High School and then Richmond. He was a middle schooler, but he was really good. He made the game when he shot at Grace Brethren to beat me year two. Um, and that really got the ball rolling for my career um, in Montgomery County Ball. This is Wayne Viner over from the Turp Talk side of things, jumping in here with Nima. I was talking to Jordan earlier and he brought up the the team takeover part of that jordan what what do you have to ask nima well the team takeover is of course in the dcaau team with a lot of notable alumni like adrian Bowie, Dion wiley more notably victor Oladipo. and i know you got involved with that very early nima what, what's the story behind that you know I, I did that was not my first aau team my uh first AAU team was the I-270 Road Warriors. I was actually uh, given an unbelievable opportunity by um, some of the leadership in I-270 uh, to run the Germantown uh, program. Uh, if those are not familiar with I-270, every single um, kind of city in Montgomery County, if you will, feeds a team to the public schools. And I was the director for Germantown, had a pretty stellar uh, ball club, and um, I was competing at a high level. We were going to tournaments, uh, we were raising our own money, and you know, it was just, again, passion. This was fun. Uh, I, I didn't think that there was going to be a career to come out of all this. I just thought, um, man, I love doing this. This is really cool. Coaching is um, a little bit like an addiction. Once you get that taste... Boy, it, it's it's intoxicating. So I kept uh, after it, and um, there was an, an opportunity. When I went to St. John's College High School, um, which was my third year in coaching, uh, we were a you know top 10 program. I had Chris Wright, who was a McDonald's All-American, Vlad Moldovano, who ended up having tremendous success, uh, most notably at American University, helping take them to the NCAA tournament. Um, and... There was, uh, you know, coaches on that staff uh, that tried to recruit me and my guys to come join their budding program, which was at the time Triple Threat. Um, and I initially rejected the offer. I didn't want to do that because I wanted to beat those guys. Um, <laughs> then I had uh, I had a conversation with the college coach by the name of Sidney Johnson, who was then an assistant at. Georgetown was just most recently the head coach at Fairfield, unbelievable coach and even better person. And he gave me some very valuable advice, uh, pretty much to sum it up. He said, do it. All right. So I Nima, did. What yeah. year was that? That was, uh, let's see, 2006, 2007, 2007. Um, I'm young, man, but when you got to dig back and remember years, I think you're starting to you're accumulate a little bit of uh, 
Well, you got some mileage. <laughs> see your citizen. See your citizenship. If you will. Yeah, yeah, I do I, have some mileage, and I'm, I don't and think... I'm proud of that. You know, I'm proud of that. That I was able to start at 18. Um, I, 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 I'm not bashful in the fact that I kind of hit my age, and, and no one knew. Uh, I try to carry myself in a way that that would never be a discussion, um, and it wasn't. I actually also once I made that transition um, to AAU programs. Uh, I started running AAU tournaments. This helped pay for my schooling at University of Maryland. It helped pay for my uh, – I had another team, which was a bunch of unsigned seniors that I put together every spring, kids that weren't the Victor Oladipos and Jerry and Grants of the world, that we as the community of, in basketball knew were great players and deserved um, a chance and maybe a platform. Public school kids maybe don't get as recruited as much. I'm a public school – product and you know i had alums like raven barber who played actually he was a private school kid he played for me but he ended up going to mount st mary's going playing professionally in canada was the rookie of the year in that league um brendan strong who ended up going to hood college division three he had division one offers um but decided to go there and now he is uh, an opponent of mine. He's at St. Joe's, but I'm extremely proud of him, and I'm really proud to, to say that I had a hand in his development. Um, but it all started with that phone call with Sidney Johnson because I wasn't going to do it. Um, Keith Stevens and uh, may he rest in peace, Artie Jones, who actually formed uh, Triple Threat, and he just passed away this this past year. The, they were the ones that really. Um, brought me into the fold and, and changed my trajectory forever. All right. So you just mentioned St. Joe's. That's St. Joe's in Philadelphia? Yeah, yeah. So Brendan, a former player of mine, um, is you know, he was a lot smarter than me. Uh, so he's been able to you kind of get on the fast track um, and get to really the same spot I am. He's an A-10 assistant. I'm an A-10 assistant. I, I'm just so proud of him. Um, because he's done it the right way. He's paid his dues. He's humble. Um, but you know, we had we had some really uh, impressive alums. Both with we called that team the DC Metro Prospects, and then uh, Triple Threat, which then ultimately became Team Takeover. Uh, and th those successes that I had was ultimately what led me to really where I stand today. All right. So you, I follow you on Twitter. We follow each other. And the other day, you, for some reason, wrote that you love this so much, but you didn't get paid at the first six stops you made. How'd that go for you? Yeah, so first six years, which included a couple multiple year stops, and it was fine. And, you know, that's that's what it should be. You, This is a this is an unbelievable profession. I think uh, fans listening will probably appreciate that, that They'd say, you know, I, I'd rather do what you're doing than doing my nine to five. Hell yeah, you would. I mean, this is a pretty good job. I love it. Um, is it stressful and high intensity and pressure? Sure is. But I, I, I live for that. And um, those those first six years, uh, it was you know two at Jewish Day. It was uh, one at St. John's, two at Paul the Six. Um, heck, I got paid negative ten thousand at UNC Charlotte because I had to pay my own way, um, which. I understood and wanted to do that because of the investment of knowledge I would get from that coaching staff. I believed in them so much. Was that, and then the seventh year. Was that um, Frank was, Lutz? Yeah, with Coach Lutz. And, and, you know, obviously he's now back in the game at Nebraska. We, we, we Again, we're a small fraternity. Uh, my coaching tree isn't uh, – this one of those big oak trees. It's it's a it's a small modest tree, but we've had we've had our fair share of success, and uh, I'm hoping to really carry the mantle for all those that came before me. And um, you know, I, I was able to then go from UNC Charlotte to um, Howard University for three months, to be honest, and then I got my first paid job at Bowie State, whopping fifteen thousand dollars, and that was that meant the world to me. And it still does. And I, I've got unbelievable pride in every single one of those stops because uh, we did special things. Every single one of those places did not experience the success that um, they experienced until uh, I was able to kind of be in the mix and, and help them. And I'm, I'm very prideful of that and uh, hope to continue that trend here at George Washington. Well, it certainly sounds positive. So just before we go to the 
the bigger stops, NC State, yeah. Maryland, GW. You were coaching and running AAU ball while you were a student at Maryland? Yes. Yeah, I was, How I was in the 20 world years old. did you do that? You know, I went to a tournament with uh, Triple Threat, the King James tournament. We went out there, and this was kind of my first taste of the quote-unquote elite of the elite basketball events. And I, I took some time and just really observed. I was also doing uh, some scouting service work, evaluating players. You know, I wasn't just there to, to coach my team. I wanted to maximize every second because at that time, I, my passion was headed towards where I am today. And I wanted to do everything I could to help me get here. Um, but, yeah, I, I just said one day, you know what, the heck with it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some of these tournaments. This is um, as long as you're organized, you're trustworthy. And you deliver on what you uh, tell your your constituents and your consumers, then they're going to continue to come back uh, year in and year out. I I, I believe uh, I was you know the, the the top event runner in in the Mid Atlantic area, if not the East Coast, outside of the Hoop Group, um, and I, I was proud of that. We had a tournament uh, with up to three hundred, you know, so. That was our biggest, and, and most of them had 80 or, or so teams. We would fill up gyms, give opportunities to those that didn't normally uh, have them. Uh, it wasn't necessarily all the big-name squads. It was more catered to the the forgotten ones that we all knew could play but don't get the platform. And I, I was proud to give them that platform. And no, looking back now, I'm, I'm glad I did because, you know, you never know – where someone's going to be in the trajectory of their career, um, especially in this game of basketball. And some of those quote unquote lesser teams are now the teams that are, um, you know, got a lot of cachet in, in AAU basketball. And um, those relationships are going to really pay off as you recruit uh, out of those programs here at GW. Name of Jordan has one for you. Jordan, go ahead. So, Nima, I recently took a class in coaching. And one of the more interesting lessons, my um, teacher was an ex-basketball coach. She told me that winning and the best coaching you can do are not inherently tied together. Like, you, some of your best coaching will be when your team's losing. What do you think about that? Yes. No, I, I agree with that. You know, obviously, our jobs in college basketball is to win. And, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, that's what we get hired for. If not, you get fired. Um, I look at my team last year at South Alabama. We were 17 and 17. Um, Richie Riley did an unbelievable job to take that team to 500. Now, that was statistically the worst year I've been a part of uh, in college basketball, but I'll, I'll, I'll be damned if I'm ashamed of, the, of that season. He did a spectacular job um, really getting that program back to where it belongs, and uh, you better believe they're going to kick everybody's butt this year uh, going into uh, Sunbelt play. They're going to be a national power um, for years to come. So um, it's it's not always, uh, you know, the best success is not always found in the winning. I, I totally agree with that. Um, unfortunately, our job is to win. My passion is to win, but my passion is also to, to win in other avenues outside of basketball, whether that be, you know, chasing down career goals for these players, uh, managers that work in our program, help put them in the right position, position to be successful, um, th- that's how you build long sustaining programs, long lasting sustaining programs is make sure that those that are with you. Um, and I, I, will never use the word under you, but with you that they get what they want out of the deal. I'm getting what I want. And so is everyone else in our staff. We got unbelievable jobs at unbelievable institutions, but there's others that do what I did when I started volunteer, um, put in the time as players, could be walk-ons, it doesn't matter. They're all working towards the same goal. And if we can put them in a position to um, be highly successful, to me, that's a that's a win as well. So, um, yes, I agree with your, your teacher. Uh, there is a lot of success, but I can tell you right now, come November to March, none of us will uh, buy into that. Um, but around this time of year, it's easy to reflect and um, say yes, but... If you ask that same question to me or anybody else on a three-game losing streak, you might get a different answer. How does a Terp get to NC State, and what was that like 
being on a say a, a rival program for a while. Yeah, um, it was fine. I loved it. My time at NC State was special. They they had um, no NCAA tournament success for five years prior to uh, our arrival. Coach Godfrey took them to the tournament year one, Sweet Sixteen. What, beat what? San Diego State, beat Georgetown. I mean, that, that's pretty good. What relationship in your coaching tree got you to NC State? Um, I, I'll give you a really good story. It, it, so one was Bobby Lutz and Rob Moxley, and, and they were both on the staff. They were the ones who brought me in at UNC Charlotte. They knew um, I had a unique skill set for program marketing and branding, which was something that Coach Godfrey was really into. Coach Godfrey did ESPN when uh, he was out of the game from Alabama, and he did our game, UNC Charlotte versus Louisville, at Louisville in Freedom Hall. The last year they played the games at Freedom Hall, and we beat Louisville like a drum, beat them by 22, a uh, really exciting game, and I, I was uh, fortunate enough to be kind of Coach Godfrey's point of contact and, and help him uh, – navigate the game hey this is what we're going to do when they run this play this is how we're going to attack their press so when he was on air he could say some favorable things about us um we we were at the level that we don't have a charter flight after the game so we stay the night and um I, i'm gonna try not to get uh, emotional as i talk about this but there's a there was a manager that worked with us um, who also passed away this year uh unfortunately mm -hmm. his name was alex johnson he was from louisville he became a sports agent. He actually um, was working hard to be my agent and um, passed away this year in an unfortunate incident in, in Italy. He had a peanut allergy, and um, my, my thoughts are forever going to be with, with him and his family. But we, we, we go out and um, go to this little spot. Coach Godfrey walks in and says, hey, in the hotel, and says, hey, thanks a lot for your help. Hey, I'm, I, I got a tab right here. You feel free to uh, get a drink on me. Uh, and I said, great. So he walks away. I looked to Alex. We called him a train. I said, hey, guess what, man? We're never going to see this guy again. We're going to run up his tag. Because this was still in my volunteer stages. Okay. And we didn't have any money. And uh, <laughs> we ran up his tag pretty good. Um, fast forward to the interview. He's just looking at me funny. He says, I remember you. And I'm like, oh, here we go. I'm, that's, that was a great waste of four-hour drive down here. And he said, I, I'll, I want to hire you. And that was that was really kind of how it worked out. So that was the best mischief I ever uh, got myself into. Um, it really worked out well that he, he remembered that and um, still kind of trying to figure out how that worked out in my favor. Yep. But it did. And, Pretty and good story there. The rest, the rest happened, and here I am. Pretty good story. Jordan. So you grew up in Damascus, as we said. You went to Maryland. What were your emotions like when you found out you are going to be the director of basketball ops for Maryland? You know, it's that's a good question because my emotions um, were one of a business. You know, when when, when you get to, to quote unquote this level, and I hate to say that like I'm some sort of like uh, guru, but when you're at this level, it's all a business, man. And and you're with heavy hitters and decision makers. I I'd, I'd hang out with former governor of North Carolina, uh, Governor Hunt, and guys like Wendell Murphy and. and these are big, big wigs down there. So that prepared me and understood. I understood, like, hey, nobody's going to give you a pat on the back because you got a degree that says University of Maryland. And I wouldn't want that. So I I didn't really kind of have that fan moment or, or you know, that reflection moment to say, ah, you know, this is so cool. It was another turnaround project. It was six years, no NCAA tournament. Um it was time for rebranding. It was time for a new roster. Uh, and it was time to roll up our sleeves and, and execute the vision that Coach Turgeon had. And he had the right vision. I believed in his vision. I studied him when he was at Wichita State uh, because he would, his staff would send out all these emails and I'd get them. Kind of the same thing I would do when I was a high school coach, send out mass emails. And I just would, every chance I get, watch his team, whether he was there or Texas A&M. And I knew what a special coach he was, is, and I wanted to, to, to do whatever I could to help. So I didn't have time to, to like, smile and, and be a fan. Um, and, you know, it was, it was just time to work. So what connection I, got you from State, from NC State, back to College Park? 
I'll be honest, I still don't know. I still don't know. It's it it's um it's a mystery. It's a mystery I don't really care to solve it because I got to do it unless this was all a dream. But um, <laughs> it was uh it was it was, you know, surreal. You know, you got a guy that's coaching at your alma mater call you and say, I, I've heard some great things about you, I want to get to know you and you're looking at your phone like, is this a prank? Is is this real? Like, this is amazing. So you, know, you hang up, you tell your, your boss, because you, you got to be transparent about these things. Say, hey, Coach Caffrey, like, this just happened. What what do I do? He says, uh, you do everything you can to get that job. That's, that's an unbelievable opportunity. Mm-hmm. And he helped me. I'm very fortunate for him to do that. He was a gracious man. He didn't hold me back one bit. And, um, you know, the rest is history. And obviously sure. three NCAA tournaments and another Sweet 16. Both times, by the way, I've lost to Kansas in the Sweet 16 in the South Region. So you yeah. can bet on it that I don't ever want to be in Kansas's uh, bracket again. Oh, you come on. You want to beat them. We know that. Yeah, you're come right. On. You know, hey. Wayne, you know me well. I do want to beat them. I want to beat them bad. Um, but uh, if, I, if I get an easier draw, I won't be upset about it. Let's talk about your role a little bit once you got to Maryland. You were the director of basketball operations. Yeah. Everybody hears that name a lot, and I'm not sure that anybody knows what that person does. Can you give us a little bit of that? You know, the, the Dobo, as it's abbreviated, is, is, <laughs> to me, it's the hardest. It's the hardest position in college basketball. I've been fortunate to to have every single role in in college athletics, except for being a head coach. I was a GA, was a, a Division two assistant, video coordinator director of operations and now on my second stint as an assistant coach um it's a thankless job you only get noticed if something gets screwed up uh you have to be highly organized you have to have some some guts uh and intestinal fortitude to say no at times to the boss uh and others on staff because you're the gate holder of uh all things outside of the lines of basketball including budget um you've got to be able to smell the smoke before there's fire you don't put the fires out you got to smell the smoke coming and say "Uh oh there's a fire brewing and if nobody ever notices the fires that got put out then you did a good job and the catch 22 is nobody notices um so it's a hard position we're we're very unique at george washington right now everyone on our staff has been in that role and that's by design because again it it truly is, and I think if you ask others in college basketball, especially those that have done it, it it's the hardest role in, in the in the program because um, you just have to juggle so much and, and be a man of so many hats. And so for us at George Washington to have everyone be in that position, um, we understand to a much greater detail how a program should be ran and operated because um, you're an extension of the head coach in so many ways, and, and if you're effective – you're allowing the head coach to coach and, and you to make decisions. And Coach Turgeon was tremendous in allowing myself and now Mark Bilkowski to, to have ownership in those decisions. And because of that, um, he does what he does best, which is coach and recruit and run the program, be the CEO. And that's ultimately what it's all about. They didn't hire him to balance the budget. That's someone else's job, and it's his job to get the right person to do it um, and oversee it, but that's someone else's job. So um, that's, in a nutshell, kind of what they do. And, again, I, I would tell Terp fans, if you see Mark Bielkowski this year, you, you, you pat him on the back and you say, good job, man, good job, because he's doing a hell of a job. Um, it's not easy. It's very thankless, and um, it just goes with the territory, but a very, very pivotal position. Uh, there's some people running around with a couple of fat heads of of him. I don't know if you saw them when we were in uh, I did Jacksonville. See that. Yeah, I did see that. So look, you left a year or so earlier. You could have had your own fat head at Maryland. Now one no, of the no, no, that that wouldn't have happened because uh, I would have scared away fans, and we're all about <laughs> that. Mark's a much better looking fellow than me. Uh, okay. so they wouldn't have, they, they, they wouldn't have done that. Those were all of Mark's friends. You know, Mark is from Jacksonville, Florida. I didn't so know that. that. Yeah, and, and you know, Mark and I were grad assistants together at UNC Charlotte. So we go back from the very beginning. Um, he and I were texting uh, going into Selection Sunday, and we didn't want to jinx it, but I wanted them to be in Jacksonville because that's a six-hour drive from Mobile. He wanted to be in Jacksonville because that's home. And 
bam, there you are. We're in Jacksonville, and and there was exuberance. But his friends um, made those uh, to kind of give him a, a little bit of uh, you know shout out in the stands, and and it was pretty cool, pretty it fun. And I got to sit with them. It, it worked for the first game. That second game, sure I did. don't want to talk about. Now you were on the Turp Talk videos a couple of years ago, and we talked a little bit about how you schedule a season. Jordan's yeah. really interested in that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just kind of curious because we always talk about how coaches, you know, they make their own schedule. So you have to call if you want to play. This doesn't apply anymore, but if you want to play Seton Hall, you call Kevin Willard over there. How do how does that work? If you're an assistant, how are you involved in scheduling? Yeah, so every staff has got a point person uh, that does scheduling. Sometimes it's director of operations. Sometimes it's an assistant. Um, it starts with them. So at the University of Maryland, uh, it was my role. It's now Mark Bielkowski's role um, to identify teams that want to fit the schedule. You got um, – it, it's not as easy as people think. It's a jigsaw puzzle. Women play in the Xfinity Center. Uh, you've got – the Beauty and the Beast event, so that takes the gym offline a day. You've got other events that come in from outside, so you've got a jigsaw of the place. So you want to play Seton Hall, you might not be able to have a common date, so that game is going to die, and and it just it's just the way it goes. Um, but you've got to have a balancing act with um, a, a, a stream extension to how your conference schedule is going to be, because we know. Uh, in, in, in every league uh, a couple years out who our conference opponents would be. We don't know dates, but we know like who we're going to play. And most leagues are now uneven. I mean, you don't play every team twice. So because it's uneven, um, some years you're going you're gonna to have the flexibility to scale back a little bit. The name of the game, to go back to one of my earlier statements, is to win. It's not to play a great team and lose. People say that all the time. You look at the net, the RPI, I don't care what it is. They That stuff really, it sounds good. That That's not what they're hunting. They're looking at that number in, next to your name in the first column. And if you schedule smart and do what's best for your student athletes so you're not traveling all over the, the country, especially in the first semester, uh, University of Maryland, where you're fortunate enough to be able to what they call buy opponents. So ask teams to come play there, give them a financial reward, and then not have to return to them the following year, then why wouldn't you do that? that well, you should do that. we got the this, best fans in, in college basketball. Um, you're going to hopefully win the game. And, again, it all matters about winning. Um, so let's the, say the that uh, you had a chance, and I don't mean to disparage anybody, but let's say you had a chance to play New Jersey Institute of Technology at home, or you could go on the road and play Kansas. Yeah, Which I'm is playing a, NGIT every time. 10 but out of 10 I've heard, so the people who say that a quad one road loss at a top 10 team actually boosts your, it's not called the RPI anymore, what's it called? The net. The, the net. net. You're saying that that isn't exactly true? I, I think that's a bunch of baloney. What, uh, what was Maryland's record last year? Um, can find out, but how many ones do we have? 22 and 22, 12. 23, somewhere around there? Yeah. Yeah, that's all people remember, okay? And that's all, that's, all, everyone's going to remember South Alabama was 17 and 17. We had unbelievable scheduling, great scheduling, 17 and 17. Nobody's going to know the amount of effort and work that went into it. They're just going to remember that number. Um, I look at programs, um, if, if you want to study somebody, look at, look at Jamie Dixon's programs. Great coach, uh, could be a Hall of Famer one day, was at one point at the, the, best winning percentage in the Big East. And because of that, he didn't have to play anybody in the non-conference. He was a great seed every year in the tournament. So he could play the, the NJITs and the, um, you know, all the, the lower level teams, if you will, and stay in his own gym, not waste money, not have his kids suffer academically because they're traveling all over the place and uh, build their brand within their own arena, give fans more memories, et cetera, et cetera. And, Voila, now, now you're in the tournament. Because uh, what, what those other teams can't do, and, and ask Gonzaga this and um, Wichita State before they, they change leagues, they, they can never 
simulate that league schedule. Big Ten Conference, that's why they went to 20 games as opposed to 18. That's two extra games against really good teams. And so you're, you're just not going to catch anybody. So that net number will end up flipping back in your favor anyway because you're going to get more opportunity. You get 13 non-conference games. Well, you get, you know, 20 opportunities to play quad one, quad two games in the Big Ten. Um, that's enough. That's enough. And I understand it. I get it. Fans want to see uh, an NBA-type schedule. You know, let's go play LeBron and the Lakers. Let's go play, you know, the Miami Heat. Let's then play Kansas at Kansas. Um, but that that's not – that's not conducive to building your team because the old, only thing that matters uh, is obviously winning and being at your best in March. And if you bury your team, especially the Terps last year, who was statistically, I believe, the youngest or one of the three or four youngest teams in the country, there's a lot of teaching that needs to go in, into getting them ready. And um, I just don't think people realize – one, how hard it is, but what an amazing job Coach Turgeon did with that group um, and improving each guy position by position, including the, the incoming freshmen who all made a jump in their summertime workouts and fall workouts. That's a, that's a major testament to that staff and, and him, uh, Coach Turgeon, to get those guys right. And they, they made it to the tournament, and winning any game against anybody in the tournament is damn hard. Well, I Especially was there. Bill I was there with yeah. you, and yeah, that, me too. <laughs> that, yeah, you were there with me. That uh, the I can't remember his name. The kid from Belmont looked like a second coming of Kevin Herter. Yeah, he was. He's a bad boy. He's a bad boy. He can play, and and teams have that. Um, you know, Rick Rick Bird is retired, and thank goodness because he gives us all nightmares. Because um, that's the type of team you get into the tournament. And they do exactly what they did. Um, it's a lot of fans I know tweeted me and probably remember. In that game, I was going through it, man. I, I was struggling because I'd never sat in the stands as a fan since I was in college. And I'll, I'll probably never do that again. That really? was excruciating. Oh, it so, was, it was well, so tough because you had no control, no say-so. And you care so much about those kids on there. You know the work that they put in. You know the work that Belmont put in. Uh, I know that staff. I know what they're about. And you know that somebody's going to be devastated. And you surely hope it's it's the guys on the other bench and, and the fans sitting behind them and not us. That reminds you of the most passionate Maryland fan that I've ever seen. And it was Dustin Clark sitting on the floor for some of the games this year. And he's just screaming at the ref. He's screaming at everybody. They actually had to bring out the security team to tell him one more time or they're going to have to remove him from the venue. It's hard, man. It's hard to transition from that seat where you're, you're expected to be cool, calm, and collected and then go into the fan section, um, especially like Dustin and I who've been at it for over a decade, and then all of a sudden now you're you're there. And, and you know, this is someone in Coach Turgeon in this program that we owe our lives to, and you're watching him play. You're like, oh, man, I'm just getting I'm getting the same vibes again. It, it was uncomfortable. It was tough. Um, I, I, I really don't want to do it again. I'd rather – I'd rather watch on TV, and, and I watched every game on TV down in, in Alabama. My neighbor was a cop, and he came over a couple of times like, you okay? And I was like, no, I'm not okay, man. We just turned the ball over again. Yeah. So, you know, we, we live oh. just like the fans on, on every possession, so I get it. I get, okay. get how they feel, too. Well, um, I have the lovely tough. position after being a Maryland fan for my whole life and yelling and screaming, and I used to wear a red wig and a flag to the games. And now, as part of the media, I can't say anything. I'm not supposed to cheer at all. It's really weird. Jordan, yeah, that's a go tough ahead. Deal. All right. Well, we got one more here before we we'll let you go. So you're at George Washington now, and you're under Jamie and Christian, who was under, who was at Mount St. Mary's for six years. Are you excited to be at GW and be back in the DMV? Yeah, I'm. I'm thrilled. I lo- I really love my time in Mobile, Alabama. I made some great friends. Um, Coach Riley gave me the chance that really nobody would give me. Um, that was always a goal of mine to get on the road as an assistant. That's a major hurdle in, in the college basketball hierarchy. And uh, he gave me that opportunity. I'll forever be indebted to him. Um, and, again, everybody better buy some stock in South Alabama. They're going to kick everybody's ass this year. I'm, I'm excited to watch them. I'm going to be a fan of them for sure. But, um, you know, I've, I've been friends with Coach Christian for going over a decade. 
in a, in a non-professional capacity. Um, a lot of my best friends are his college teammates. Um, I've gone to watch his teams play live. Uh, matter of fact, they're undefeated when I'm in the building. That's a fun little fact. Um, but, I mean, he is a tremendous coach. Uh, and I'm really excited to learn from him. Um, his vision for how we're positioning George Washington University is unmatched. Um, I'm not going to share all the blueprint, but I, I will tell you that if we execute on his on his path that he's laid out for us, um, there's no reason why we can't be the next Gonzaga or the next power mid-major and compete for national championships. That's our goal. We're not bashful in saying that. Uh, we want people to know that that's what it is. Um, he's, he's executed two of the top uh, turnarounds in, in the NCAA uh, in his first years at both institutions. He was the head coach at Mount St. Mary's and Siena. They were picked last uh, at Siena, finished tied for second, had a chance to be first. Um, and you don't do that in a first-year situation unless you really know what you're doing. We're studying film now. Uh, we're putting things in place to make sure this program uh, really takes off. Uh, another thing we're not bashful about uh, screaming at the top of our lungs is that we're located um, in the world's most powerful city. And we are positioned in, a, in such a unique place that allows us to be first or second every year in internships uh, for our not just our student athletes, but all students. Um, we've got an unbelievable campus situation. Uh, there's, there's just, I walk around with a smile, and so does our staff, because it's a really beautiful and unique campus. I'd never been there. Um, and I sent three players to GW as a high school coach, um, Mo Creek, uh, Lasan Croma, and Joe McDonald. And I, I never experienced it like I do now. It's a, it, I've said it um, in, in other interviews. It's a utopia. Um, there's oil right underneath the ground. All the different uh, metaphors and similes you could think of uh, are true. And we're, we're, we've got limitless potential. We've got a president, a CFO, and an athletic director that's got uh, great foresight and vision. They're all new to the school and pushing us in the right direction. Um, we've got plans to do really special things. I won't steal our thunder, but there, there's some things that are really unheard of. And, and we're going to slowly but surely put it out there. And um, I think it's going to open up a lot of eyes. We're almost uh, at 100% closing rate on every kid that's come on campus and experienced us that we've actually offered. Well, and, I'm not uh, surprised. That, that I am not surprised that you can convince a kid to go to GW. And when it gets close to basketball season, we're going to have to have you come back on and talk about the schedule and uh, how people can get tickets to go down the Smith Center and check you out when they're not watching the Maryland Terrapins. Mason? Yeah, Nima, thanks for coming on. It's been a great interview. We'll have to – we left actually some questions out, so when we come back on, we'll still have some material from back in your turf days to ask you about. Fantastic. I appreciate you all having me. Uh, my message to turf fans, support the program, support those kids. They give it their all. You have no idea how hard they um, attack their workouts and, and their off season. Coach Turgeon is, is an unbelievable coach and an unbelievable person, and I'm really excited for the direction that program is going. And, um, I'm looking forward to being a fan again, but just not in the stands. I ain't doing that no more. I'm going to just be watching <laughs> on TV from here on out. All right, Nima, thanks for being on. And Mason? Yeah, uh, thank. thanks, Nima. Y'all take care. Take care, Turk Nation. <laughs>